As you've probably guessed from the title of the video, this video is about the humanistic approach in psychology. Uh, like the majority of my videos, this is focused on the AQA A-level specification. Uh, and for the humanistic approach, you actually only need that in the second year. So if you're doing the AS exams, you won't actually need those, but you do need them for the end of year two, end of year 13 uh, exams. So without further ado, um, so the humanistic approach then. Um, well, the two researchers that are really concerned with the humanistic approach are Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. We'll come on to those uh, two a bit later on in the video. Um, but basically, the idea behind the humanistic approach is, well, it's a lot different to the other approaches, actually. It, the humanistic approach rejects uh, the other approaches. Um, it says that the other approaches are too focused on the negative side of psychology. They're all to do with, well, if you look at the humanistic approach, Sorry, if you look at the psychodynamic approach, uh, it's all to do with negative thinking, repressed thoughts. They called it the sick half of psychology, which focuses on uh, mental health problems, things like that. So the humanistic approach wanted to take a different view. They wanted to say, right, what are the conditions that we need to, to thrive? What do we need to be the best that we can possibly be? So it's quite a positive approach. Um, it's known as the third force in psychology after the behaviorist and the psycho psychodynamic approach. Um, and as the title suggests, it looks at the individual human, the humanistic approach. So it looks at subjective, personal experience, uh, individual self-determination. So very much focusing on the individual rather than the group or, or, or general rules. So that's the, the initial idea behind the humanistic approach. The first concept in the humanistic approach is free will. Uh, and that follows on from, from what I just said. So if you're focusing on the individual, if you're looking at the, at the individual um, as in really important, then you need to believe in free will. You need to believe that that individual has control over their own destiny. You don't necessarily believe in fate. Um, terms, as act, terms such as active agents um, are used in the humanistic approach. So they believe that any individual is an active agent in their own environment, in their own life. What that means is that you as an individual, um, you have control over what you do, um, the effort you put into things, where you take your life, what direction you take it in. They see individuals as unique, so no two people are the same, uh, and that we can all react to the same stimulus in different ways, and we can take our lives in different directions. Um, obviously, free will would, would be the, the opposite of deterministic, which says that we're, we're preset um, with ideas and, and our life is just going to turn out the way it's going to turn out because of our preset ideas. Um, that idea of the difference between free will and determinism comes up in the issues and debate section. Um, and that again is a, is a year two, um, year 13 section uh, that you'll look at later on. Um, it's known as, another way to describe the humanistic approach is the person-centered approach. Uh, and obviously that makes sense based on uh, everything I've just said there. So the individual is, a, is at the center of the humanistic approach. And again, the, the name says it all, the humanistic approach. You look at the, the individual human. Um, there are some really important key terms that you need to talk about when you're talking about the humanistic approach. And self-actualization is one of them. Um, and self-actualization is the desire to reach your full potential. So uh, Abraham Maslow believed that we all strive for self-actualization. We strive to reach our full potential, that we desire, that we have this innate need. We want to push towards personal growth, development, being better than we can be. Uh, and if we reach self-actualization, we are fulfilled in our lives, we are satisfied, we have goals that we can achieve, we are goal-orientated. Um, and something, probably one of the most famous parts of the humanistic approach is the hierarchy of needs. Um, and at the top of that, that is the self-actualization. Out of all of my learning in psychology, the hierarchy of needs is the thing that I've probably come back to time and time again because um, not only obviously do you learn it as an approach in psychology but when you look go into other areas of life so I'm obviously a teacher um, when we teach 
they teach teachers about the hierarchy of needs. And if you go into business, you'll learn about the hierarchy of needs. This is quite a fundamental um, idea, psychological idea, really, really famous. Um, so the idea here is that we have certain levels that we wish to achieve. Um, and you need to work your way through the levels to achieve this top goal, this self-actualization. Um, so if we start at the bottom there, that's our physiological. So what um, Maslow said was that we need to make sure our physiological needs are seen to first off. So we need to make sure we can breathe, obviously. We need to be able to eat, to drink. Uh, we need to reproduce. We need homeostasis. We need to excrete bodily waste. They are our physiological base needs, uh, and sleep obviously in there as well. And we need to satisfy those needs before anything else. Once we satisfy those needs, you then go up to the next level, which is safety. Um, so you would want security of body. You'd want to know that you know your body is safe. So someone in a war zone probably wouldn't have security of body. We would want security of employment. Do you have a chance to get a job? Security of resources. So you've just eaten, but do you know where your next meal is coming from? So maybe someone on Bear Grylls the Island, for example, they wouldn't have security of resources. Um, so they might not be able to reach their self-actualization. Uh, security of morality, security of the family, security of health, and security of property. So do you have somewhere to go back to? And again, if all of those are achieved, you can then go up to the next level, which is love and belonging. And that is personal relationships, so that's um, friendships, that's family members, that's sexual intimacy, having romantic relationships. And once you've achieved those, you can go on to esteem, so self-esteem, your, your personal self-esteem, your confidence. Uh, do you feel a sense of achievement? Do you feel respected by others? Do you feel you can respect others? Um, and if you achieve all of that, you can then reach self-actualization. So that's, having the, that's what we're all striving for. That is our morality, our sense of right and wrong, being able to be creative and come up with new ideas, being spontaneous, um, seeking out new possibilities, problem solving, lack of prejudice. So this is the idea that humans are always somewhere within this. Uh, hierarchy of needs and we would need to satisfy the base needs before you can move up to the next level so that is what uh, Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, suggested is a key fundamental point of of the human experience uh, and is a really important concept within the humanistic approach to psychology uh, this diagram is a updated version of the hierarchy of needs and would suggest what we'd more uh, likely our baseline needs are now. Um, this isn't Maslow's one, but just kind of uh, an assumption of what most people would strive for these days. Really sad if you think about it. Um, another concept within the humanistic approach is something called conjurance. Um, and conjurance is linked to our what we call our self-identity, so what we are now, and our self-perception, what we see ourselves as being. Um, and the idea of conjurance is if these two things are close, you have conjurance, and that's a good thing. But if these two things are far apart, they're incongruent, and that's a bad thing. Incongruence you do not want. Um, a diagram to represent that is here. So obviously that first um, section there is incongruent. There, there is a big gap between the self-image and the ideal self, so how you see yourself now and how you see yourself wanting to be. Um, so there, there's not a great deal of overlap there. There's a big difference. Um, and so, yeah, self-actualization would be difficult here um, and it leads to negative outcomes. We'll speak about that in a moment. This here would be congruent. This, there is a big overlap here between the way you would see yourself and the way you would want to be, and so that's congruent, and that's better, that leads to, to better outcomes. Um, so if there is incongruence, the idea is that this would lead to a feeling of worthlessness, to low self-esteem, and obviously you wouldn't want that. Um, this was, uh, Carl Rogers came up with, with this idea, and he would say that incongruence is a result of not having 
unconditional positive regard as a child. So unconditional positive regard is where a parent, no matter what, would love their child, they'd want the best for them, they would be proud of them, they would dote on them, they would love their child. Regard, it doesn't matter what they end up with, or sorry, what the, what the child is like, they are giving them this unconditional positive regard. They're being positive towards them. If they have limits set on love, and so they say, I will only love you if you are the captain of the football team, or I only love you if you're getting A stars. If the child is feeling that there is conditions set on the love, these are known as conditions of worth, um, then that is what would lead to incongruence. So these are all really important terms you need to know. Congruence, incongruence, unconditional positive regard is an important term. Conditions of worth is a positive term. So you, you want unconditional positive regard. You don't want conditions of worth. Um, that would all lead to incongruence. Um, and there'd be this big gap between your perceived self and your ideal self. Um, and that would lead to negative outcomes. You wouldn't be able to self-actualize. Rogers said, however, that there is a bit of positive here, and this will end up acting as an evaluation. There are some real-world applications to the humanistic approach in therapy. Um, Rogers said that client-centered therapy, which is the, the humanistic type of therapy, again, another term you need to know, client-centered therapy. The aim of client-centered therapy would be to reduce the gap between the perceived self and the ideal self. Um, he said that a therapist should offer this unconditional positive regard that a parent maybe didn't um, when the individual was a child. Uh, so it's almost replacing the, the, the parent figure, I guess. Um, and that is ha that's the humanist's idea of how treatment would be effective and treatment would work. Moving on to the AO3 evaluation then. Uh, and there are a few evaluative points um, and some positives and negatives. So starting with the strengths of the approach, um, the humanistic approach is seen as the least reductionist approach. Um, lots of the other approaches break down the human experience into very um, small parts, such as in the psychodynamic approach, they focus on the, the different areas of, of personality or of the mind, id, ego, superego, for example. Uh, in the biological approach, they'll look at uh, certain chemicals that explain human behavior. And actually, if you look at human behavior, it's very complex. There's lots of things to it. Um, and reductionism can be an issue. So the fact that the humanistic approach uses what we call holism, it looks at the whole individual, um, is really a positive, and, and it can be seen as the most kind of valid measure of, of the human experience. It looks at humans as they are in their own experience, which, which is obviously a good thing. Uh, as well as that, as I've already mentioned, it is the least deterministic of the approaches. Some of the other approaches, again, look at biological approach, if you have high testosterone, you will be aggressive. That, that That's one of the probably one of the theories of the biological approach, whereas from the humanistic approach, it's it's a lot more, um, it suggests and promotes more free will. It says that we actually have more of a say in what's going on, uh, and that can only be seen as a positive thing. And leading on to that, it, it is the most positive approach. Um, it, one of the strengths and one of the, the things that have been celebrated about the humanistic approach is it's been said to have brought the person back into psychology. So where some of the other approaches might have broken down the human experience and, and you know, we're trying to explain what it is to be a, to be a human via very uh, different methods, actually looking at an individual as a whole, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Um, and so that's why being a positive approach, looking at the, the positives within individuals is seen as a really good thing. Looking at weaknesses of the approach then, um, one of the criticisms that has been put towards the humanistic approach is that it has poor uh, real life application. Um, so it's all well and good looking at the individual and, and looking at self actualization but what, you know, what good does that actually have for individuals' day-to-day -day life. You compare that against some 
uh, an approach like the cognitive approach where you're looking at memory and how the human memory system works that's really helpful to know in the learning process um, eyewitness testimony things like that but in the humanistic approach it's quite difficult to see where these theories actually have application and um, one area that they do is in counseling uh, and there's the the humanistic approach um, person-centered therapy um, but other than counseling where else can we use these theories and that's quite hard to see and that is one of the first weaknesses of the humanistic approach. Another weakness is that it's quite hard to test. So if you've got these theories such as self-actualization, reaching your own full potential or congruence, the, the gap between your perceived self and your um, ideal self, well, those are quite subjective. They're then quite hard to test. Um, and so it's hard to test these things, that's known as unfalsifiable. If you can't say what these things are, if you can't do tests into these things, um, then how do we actually know they exist? Um, so from an outsider's point of view, that would be seen as a weakness. Actually, from a humanist point of view, from Roger's point of view, we would say, well, it doesn't matter. This isn't a scientific method necessarily that, that looks at um, rules for general people and so why would you need to test it what you, you need to look at the individuals so there's a bit of a balance there and you know I've got this under weaknesses of the approach but but actually it's more of a discursive point and, a, and an evaluative point from the humanist point of view you, it doesn't matter but if you compare it to the other approaches which is again a really good way to evaluate a, a, an approach is to compare it with other approaches then it, it's lacking and uh, and isn't as falsifiable as some of the other approaches are. Last but not least, it's said to be culturally biased. Um, it's quite an American view of the world to say that you are very important as an individual. Not all societies, not all cultures see an individual as um, the most important part. Actually, the group collective is often seen as more um, important than any individual in kind of eastern cultures um, and so there could be a cultural bias here we're putting the view of the world that an individual is important onto lots of cultures where in that culture maybe the individual isn't that important um, so you know the American dream looking at you know you can be what you want to be when you want to be it that's very individualistic it looks at you as a person and sees you as really important whereas actually there are plenty of cultures out there where the the groups, the success of the group is far more important than the success of the individual. Um, and so it's quite a Western idea that, that the individual um, is important and actually more collectivist. Yeah, Eastern cultures would suggest that maybe that that's not important. And therefore, in those cultures, the humanistic approach obviously wouldn't hold up very well um, because that, that's not what's seen as important uh, in those sorts of cultures. Um, so that kind of rounds up our evaluation of the approach as well. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I will try to do another video on the comparison of approaches. That's quite an important part of the year two specification. So now that we've had a chance to look at all of the approaches, what they are, evaluations of them all, actually at, in year two, the questions that you're likely to get are outline the cognitive approach, for example, and then compare that against the humanistic approach. That's That could be a 16 marker, so we'll look at how to answer those. But thank you for listening for now. Um, subscribe, tell your friends to subscribe, uh, and look out for future videos.